Welcome to Dying Generation. I'm Bunny Williams, and with me is... Steven Scott Norfolk. So what's going on, dude? You've been really kind of busy lately. Well, let me spin you a yarn. Yes, please. That I like to call the apartment that could not be inhabited. This is what's been going on the last two weeks. Finally, I found a roommate, right? Right. And we're gonna, he's homeless too, living in his car. My friend Ari. And we agreed to get a two bedroom apartment together. Both of us have broken leases on our record, so that's not good, right? Right. So we go and uh, we find this one apartment complex that takes people with broken leases. You just have to pay an extra deposit, right? So we go to this place, and I talked to them Wednesday before last. And they said they had an apartment for immediate move-in. Uh, all we would have to do is uh, bring in the deposit. So that Thursday, bring in the deposit, $200, pay it. And... uh the lady who was the leasing agent wasn't there, so they didn't know when we were going to move into the apartment. So then I call her, and uh, she's after she got the deposit, she's like, oh, the apartment isn't ready yet on Friday. I'm like, okay, I thought you said you had one for immediate movement. Well, I thought I did, but there's still some stuff to do, and it will have it finished by the weekend, and you can't move in uh, next Wednesday. I'm like, okay. So... <clears throat> call her back the next Wednesday. Hi, yeah, is our apartment ready yet? Oh, because uh, uh, it's our move-in date. And she goes, oh, uh, well, we're, we're resurfacing, resurfacing the bathtub today, and they still have to clean, steam clean the carpet, so it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, not today. How about Friday, which is the 31st? You can, you know, and I said, well, I said, we were looking for someplace immediately, and it's already been a week. She's like, well, I don't see how, you know, a couple of days is going to make any difference. Uh, I'm yeah, living in living my fucking car. car. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so now I lost a little. I lost a little bit of track. Have you already given her the deposit? Yes. And the okay, application so. fees, and we handed in our applications last Friday for move in this Wednesday. We've got all clear. We're good to go. We have to pay an extra deposit, but we are getting the apartment. Wednesday comes. Apartment's not ready. So wait till Friday. Friday, I call her at 10 o'clock in the morning. Hi, is our apartment ready yet? Oh, um, actually, I'm going to walk over there right now and check it out. I'll call you back. 1230 comes. No call. I call her back. She's not in. We'll leave a message for her. She'll call you back. Three o'clock. No call back. I call her, get her on the phone, and I said, "Yeah, we're ready to we're ready for our, to move into our apartment today." Oh, uh, I'm I'm a hundred percent sure it's ready, but let me call housekeeping just to make sure. I'll call you back. Five five thirty six. No call back. So I'm still in my car. They have my deposit. I'm still in my fucking car. My friend's still in his fucking car. Okay, that's what I've been so busy with this last two weeks. In case our listener yeah. Bill doesn't know, we almost we didn't record any shows last week or this week because I've been so busy fucking around with this ignorant cunt. And yes, cunt who can't seem to do her fucking job. And I'm starting to think that it's they don't want us to move in there is what I'm thinking. They're trying to discourage us by having it take forever. Uh, yeah, and I'm kind of wondering if it's not some kind of a scam to just be uh, your deposit money. That's the well, they have, to refund my, they have to refund my deposit if we don't get our apartment. But they won't refund the $80 we paid in application fees. Right. So I have decided that uh, Monday, um, I told my friend, I said, look, I said, I can't deal with them anymore. You're going to have to call Monday and find out what's going on with the apartment. I said, if I get on the phone with her and she says, I don't know one more time, I'm just going to drive down there with a baseball bat and beat her head to a bloody fucking pulp. And he goes, okay. And I'm like, and if the apartment's not ready Monday, I'm going to call and I'm going to request my deposit back and we'll go look somewhere else. Uh Uh-huh. So it looks like I might be spending Thanksgiving in my car. 
Uh, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Yeah. Well, at least huh? there's not much decorating to do for Thanksgiving. You can hang some stuff from your rearview mirror. Yeah, and and if I mean, you know, it's, it's getting cool down here, but if I left the turkey up on my dash, it would probably cook fully for my shift. <laughs> you know? Have perfect, perfectly brown, juicy, delicious turkey on the dash. Isn't that how they serve it in Australia on the on the dash? Oh no, that's on the Barbie. Okay, never mind. That's on the Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the nightmare I've been dealing with, and uh, so so. Welcome to my nightmare, as Alice Cooper once said. People. Yeah. <laughs> so what's up with you, Bunny? Well, the first episode of Bob's Dirty Shorts released last night. I saw it. I, I mean, this is this this is kind of an interesting episode because we're actually recording it the day before this episode goes out, so we can actually put out like current news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, I I I really can't believe how bad it tanked. Did it tank? I consider this tanking, yeah. Why? How many views did you get? Uh, right now it is something at like 160. Let me just take a look. Oh gosh, you poor baby, dude! I probably reached out to a hundred thousand people. Okay. Yeah. 158 views. All right. That's pretty good. Damn good for one night. You gotta, let, you gotta let word get out. Not how far I put it out there. Yeah, well, you know, okay. people were busy last night. And it was Halloween for that day. I was promoted on a friend's podcast. Okay, outside mm-hmm. the cinema. Thanks, Bill. I really appreciate it, Bill. Totally. He he has a listenership of approximately twenty thousand. Uh huh. Okay. So like right there, one hundred and fifty-eight views. You know that should be yeah. a bit higher. But on it top of that, be. I went to, I went to a lot of a lot of pages and groups that I'm a part of, you know, with like two thousand members, three thousand members, all of that, you know, yeah. and asking if I if I can put up ads and things like that. Uh huh. So, just with doing that, I had approximately fifty thousand people. Yeah. That I was putting putting it out to. Then I personally emailed each and every one of my friends, yeah, of which there are 270, and they were all fucking fantastic. A lot yeah. of people reshared it and all that, you know. Yeah, so, I liked it because my computer was down in the uh, phone app won't let me share. Yeah. So I liked. Well, it. even a even a like, you know, I, that gets really confusing to me. Like, you know, it. it if you like, I don't know what's better, liking it or sharing it. You know, it, uh, share share shares usually uh, get into the timeline more than likes do. Likes are usually in that yeah. little scroller. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then the Twitter feeds. I set up automatic tweets. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote out a list of twenty four. What I would call Bobisms. Uh huh. Okay. And like a lot of funny stuff in there. All right? Yeah. Each with a link to the video. Yeah. All right. And then I set them up for automatic tweets. Uh huh. Okay. Now, at this point in all, I have four Twitter accounts. Yeah. I have one for Bunny Williams, which I really don't use. I have one for Undead Cow Studios. I have Dying Generation and the Pope on Film. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. And Undead Cow Studios, Dying Generation, and Pope on Film, I've really been been working those. Okay. Yeah. So Undead Cow Studios has 950 followers. Dying Generation and Pope on Film have approximately 650 each. Yeah. Okay. So to all four accounts, a Bobism would go out once an hour. Yeah. 
with the link. So I'm hitting a lot of people there. And there are retweets there as well. One woman retweeted me. She has 15,000 uh, 15, followers. Yeah. You know? Uh-huh. So for me, the way I'm seeing it, 158 views is like a hideous performance. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, please tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> you are You are wrong because it was Halloween last night. Lots of people weren't even, you know, accessing their Twitter or Facebook accounts. And so if I, you know, give it a week. Maybe you know, keep sending, keep 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 uh, posting it on Facebook and and uh, Twitter and stuff, and give it a week and and see if you get bigger numbers. But yeah, but, I mean, 158 views for one day for 24 hours, not bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's not viral or nothing, but <laughs> you know, I, I think I could have gotten I think I could have gotten more views by cats accidentally jumping on the keyboard. Yeah. Which means I'm getting by the cats, too. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking pussies. So, yep. so, for our listener, Bill, share it. <laughs> share it, Bill. It's all on you, Bill. It's all yeah. on you. You need to do this for me. It's all you, on you. If you um, want to be I'm invited to the Dying Generation Christmas party, Bill. That's right. Which will be held in Steve's car. It, yep. Capacity of five. So uh, there are only four, well, two, three seats left. And Bunny's going to be here. Uh, so, so, uh, so that means that, that there will be sex. It, it'll be kind of accidental, you know. Yeah. That many people stuck in the car. Shit, like like, bo- like boob brushing and, and uh, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I brushed your boob with my elbow. I think I just came. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm kind of thinking maybe I, maybe I'm gonna do it as a daily show instead of a weekly show. You know. Yeah. Which don't know. Maybe putting one out in the next couple of hours. I mean, I have over forty that are like completely done and ready to go. Wow. You know. Uh, in all, I have about 90. Yeah. So I have, I have a few more to cut. Yeah. They don't take terribly long to cut. Yeah. Uh, and we would just have to crank out production. If I still want it to run for two years, I, I would need, uh, something like 750. Yeah. That before I forget. Yeah. Yeah. So we would have to crank up production, but, you know, Jeannie and I do have fun doing, 730, Uh, Jeannie and I do have fun doing them, you know, and we have it now, so (laughs) we have Bob in a box. Bob in a box. Yeah, Jeannie had this, like, kind of a large Tupperware box kind of a thing Uh that's Made to go under your bed. Okay. And she had like a blanket or something in it. So she took the blanket out and she put all the Bob stuff in the box. In the box. <laughs> box of Bob. So box of really, Bob. Just add Bunny. Yeah, right? <laughs> so we should be able to build the set in like an hour, hour and a half tops. Yeah. You know? So maybe two hours to set the camera, the gels, the makeup, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And start shooting episodes. So, I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I, I'm sort of thinking, like, if I release another episode today, then w- maybe I can bounce off of whatever I built yesterday. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I really cannot do that every time. Yeah, and 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 for our listener, Bill, where can we find the uh, Bob's Dirty Shorts? It is on YouTube at Undead Cow Films. Which I all right, cool. Think. But Undead Cow Films, that's where you can find uh, Bob's Dirty Shorts. You can also find the video version of Dying Generation. 
the Pope on film, and a lot of other stuff that was produced by Undead Cow Studios. I've got my short films. I've got the live events that I shot. I've got interviews, promos, all kinds of stuff. So get over there, kitties. Get over there, kiddos, and check it out. It's a bundle of joy. Yeah. So. Yeah, but I got I got a little bit of uh, good news today. Cool. Uh, wow. There is a, a, a book reviewer blogger uh, that I sent my book to, yeah. and uh, I had asked him about a week ago if he received the file, and he responded today with, "Yes, I got the file. Reading it now. Really loving it so far." For the alleys ran red. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So uh, once we once we uh, he posts the review, I'll be able to give our listener Bill the uh, address, and he can go check it out. And you know, hopefully buy a copy. Bill, come on, throw a cool. brother a bone. Exactly, Bill. Again, it's all on you, man. <laughs> all on you. Sorry to make you the hinge, but. <laughs> one day we're going to have to sit down and talk about actually cutting some promos of these kinds of things like about a 30 second spot and yeah I was planning on when I get into the show. yeah I was planning on getting when I get into the apartment I was planning on making a little commercial book commercial for the alleys ran red and one for us uh, and mom's clothing yeah 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 and then cut some promos to the actual shows themselves, and then we we can you know get other podcasts to send us their promos. Yeah, yeah. So that would be good. And a little bit more that way. Yeah. We're giving we're giving all our secrets away, people. If you want to know how to do, if you want to know how to do this, just listen to the show. We're going to teach you how. It's DIY. It's it's all open and above board what's going on here on this year show. <laughs> we we have that thing that, that government doesn't. Transparency. <laughs> so I, I I don't know where I saw or heard this word, but there's this word that's been stuck in my mind all week because it just cracks me up. Okay. P- pusillanimous. Pusillanimous. I will use it in a sentence. Sir, you are pusillanimous. You know what that means? No. Cowardly. Okay. Pusillanimous. I'm like, I'm going to start using that, like, all the time. Because nobody knows what it means. Pusillanimous. Uh. Yeah, so uh, for the kiddos out there listening, I'll try and have an odd word of the week for you. Every show from now on, I'll, I'll find some. I'll buy like a 1956 uh, Oxford Dictionary and go through it and find uh, stuff like pusillanimous. Huh. Okay. That that sounds like a good idea. Now, are mm-hmm. are you saying Q like cue ball P. or P no, like P. puke? P. Pusillanimous. Q. Pusillanimous. That's yep. Pusillanimous. Really kind of disgusting sounding. I know. But it just it sounds like something somebody would say right before they, like, whipped out their rapier. Yeah. You know? Uh-huh. And I don't, I heard it in a movie somewhere, you, and I can't remember what. The, the way you said it mm-hmm. just reminded me that Django is now on Netflix. Ah, yeah. I mean, awesome movie. Oh, that was the first time I saw it. Oh, my God, yeah. I was, like, totally, totally impressed. Yeah, what a great fucking film. Quentin I, uh, has really taken an interesting turn between this and Inglorious Bastards. Yes, he has. He 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 grows up and he grows up and he grows up. He's all grows up, uh-huh. as they said in Swingers. Uh-huh. You know, now Django, I was kind of, I was, it was getting great reviews. It was getting a lot of good talk. It was getting a lot of good buzz. You know. Yeah. I was a, a, a little concerned that Django was a black character because it, you know, it was kind of like, are you, are you making him a black character just to make him a black character? What's, what's the point here? Uh, not so much that, that it's bad for, like, the Django character, because I don't know if our listeners know, Django is basically a spaghetti western character. 
There mm-hmm. are a, a lot of Django movies out there. And yeah. Django as a character is almost like a public domain character. So yeah. like there there are a lot of Django movies from Italy. There are a lot of Django movies from Japan where obviously Django is Japanese in that particular case. So yeah. him being a black character, that's not too terribly a big big you know, big deal, you know. Yeah. Uh it's not like turning Captain Kirk into a black character, you know? Yeah. But the point was like, okay, well, you know, why are you doing that? And then sitting down and watching the movie, it, movie, it becomes like so totally obvious. Yeah. Don't spoil it. You did it. And it's fucking brilliant. Yeah, it's a great movie. My brother, uh, Tim, was not, not impressed with it because his thing was uh, that, you know, um, Quentin Tarantino said it was going to be a Western. And my brother Tim was like, that wasn't a Western. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? It's it's a bounty hunter movie in the West. That's a Western. Uh, you know? I, I think he's got some room to argue. I, I don't particularly care, you know? I don't mm-hmm. care if it's a Western or a period piece or anything like that. I think you could put up an argument and say, well, it's a period piece. Yeah. And not so much a Western, but it's it's brilliant. It's absolutely yeah. brilliant. Yep. He's got something else on his plate next. I don't know what it is, though. It's uh, the Hard Eight or something like that. And there's been a lot of buzz around here because it's going to be shot in Colorado right around Telluride. Oh, nice. So. Very nice. A few people a few people from the area might be drifting down that way soon. You know. Cool. Yeah. So I have this pair of shoes. Totally off topic here. I have this pair of shoes, uh, these white tennis shoes that the the front of them sort of like busted open. And Uh for a couple of weeks, we were getting some pretty heavy rains. And so there was continuously like this little lake around my car that I would have to step in when I got out of my car. Uh And the inside of the shoes got so muddy that I just took, I've been wearing them. I put them on yesterday and I've been wearing them all night and I'm wearing them until just now. And I take them off. And there was so much dirt on the inside of these shoes that my feet look like I've been working barefoot in a coal mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> Either that or I have diabetes. I, I one or the other. What? One or the other. <laughs> you, you haven't tried duct taping them or anything? No, I'm... I'm uh, Found a, believe it or not, a ten dollar pair of tennis shoes at Walmart. Ten bucks. Yeah. And if they only last a month, who cares? It's ten bucks. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to uh, toss these ones in the garbage. And Tuesday, well, on Tuesday I'm going to toss these ones in the garbage, and I'm going to get um, the ten dollar tennis shoes and see how long they last. Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm not like a Melda Marcos or anything. You know, I, I have two pairs of shoes. I have my black dress shoes. And I have a pair of tennis shoes, and that's it. And I just wear them until they completely break down, and then I go buy another pair. Uh-huh. Uh, and these ones have lasted probably a year. Uh, and they were 25 bucks. So I figured... Yeah, that's not bad for 25 bucks? Yeah, not bad for 25 bucks at all. Because, kiddos, whenever you get older and you're still working a shitty minimum wage job trying to support yourself... You have yeah. to buy cheap shoes. If you want those Air Nikes, yeah, you better get a good job. Yeah. Last year, I got I got from Kmart, and I think I wound up spending a little more, like thirty five or something like that. But yeah. So far, I've gotten a year and a half, and they're still pretty healthy. Cool. Uh, I was getting I was getting shoes from Payless Shoes, and I would be lucky if I got a fucking year out of that. I know. Those shoes are crap. crap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of what Ray Bradbury said in uh, Dandelion Wine, I believe it was, that whenever you buy a new pair of tennis shoes, there's something magical about them because it seems like you can run faster and jump higher Yeah. in a brand new pair of tennis shoes than you can with ones that have been worn for a while. <laughs> yeah. And so, but I always feel yeah. like that whenever I put on a new pair of shoes. I'm like, yeah, come on. Mmm, caress my feet. You know? Hey, that shoes is just a piece of 
fucking shit. I mean, I can't believe how goddamn bad their shoes are. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, you know and, and I, I would like to welcome our new sponsor, Payless Shoes. Thank you. So, well, um, you know, whenever you have eight year old. the show. <laughs> <laughs> whenever you have eight year old Korean girls making shoes, yeah. that's what's going to happen. You know? Yeah, you know what 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 day. happened? What happened to craftsmanship, Bunny? What happened to it? <laughs> it's gone. You don't even see it in our society anymore. Hardly. You have to go to an art fair or a state fair or something <laughs> to see craftsmanship. You can't buy anything that has craftsmanship in it. It used to be a point of pride in this country that it was craftsmanship, that it was made in America by craftsmen. And now everything's made in China and Korea and India and, and, you know, and there is no craftsmanship in those places. It's all stamped out by machine. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would, I would bet you money that you probably couldn't even find a place in Colorado Springs that would resole a pair of dress shoes for you. To resole a pair of shoes? Yeah, I would doubt it. Yeah, much less block a hat. Yeah. You know, so, oh, speaking of news, thank you. Okay. Uh, Ebola. Okay. Everybody's freaking out I, about I, the Ebola. I dated her, yeah. Did you? Uh-huh. Yeah. She was, a, she, she was a tall Nubian girl, wasn't she? Um. Yes, she was, <laughs> and, but it, 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 it was all okay once she picked the scab off. It was good. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, my friend started totally freaking out saying he's going to spend all his money buying guns and ammo and canned food and all this other stuff and, and sequester himself in his house. And uh, so me and him and another guy were having a conversation uh, about Ebola, and I have two theories on Ebola okay. in America. One, the U.S. government allowed Ebola into this country so that they could uh, have FEMA take control of the country under martial law. And that's why FEMA's been buying up bullets and guns. I, I've heard that. Now, my other theory is, and it's not really a theory, it's just a, a, an idea. And that is that, you know, Ebola comes here, it's a huge outbreak, millions die. And suddenly, the unemployment problem goes away. Uh, True. <laughs> so, how can we cure unemployment in this country? Kill half the population. I kind of go more more the other way, where I spend myself a lot of time wondering, like, why do certain things become like news triggers and get the politicians all like up in arms and shit like that? We've had Fear more based by some bird flu in this fucking country mm-hmm. than than Ebola. Yeah, it's fear based yeah. news. Right, but why didn't bird flu trigger this kind of fear? You know what I mean? Because bird bird flu, you but die, but star. but Ebola, your Ebola, your body just starts to like disintegrate, sort of like a, a flesh eating virus. Yeah. You know, and you start you bleeding know, from every orifice and shit. And at this point, how how many, by the way, the Tarantino movie is Hateful Eight. How many people have died in this country so far of Ebola? One. Maybe, uh, is it just the one? Just the one. The guy that came, brought it into the country. Yeah. Here was my other theory, too. Uh, and I posted so it on you Facebook. Actually have, so you actually have better odds of seeing an episode of Bob's Dirty Shorts than dying of Ebola. <laughs> oh, I, I think I'm using that as a fucking tagline. There you go. <laughs> now, my other theory is... Oh, what was my other theory? You, you made me derail my train of thought, damn it. I had, I had an idea, and now it's gone. Anyway, so oh, and and of okay. course the 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 uh the theory that um they brought Ebola to this country so that they could have everybody vaccinated for Ebola and in the uh vaccinations would be um nanobots 
yeah. they put inside your body to track you and, and do other things and kill you by remote control and stuff. Well, I had thought that if there was a serious Ebola outbreak, yeah, there, there would be a vaccine. I'm sure they already have a vaccine, you know, but there would definitely be a shortage. Yeah. Okay? So what we would need to do is we would have to take, like, two Ebola patients mm-hmm. and put them in Thunderdome. Thunderdome. Yeah. No, not Thunderdome. Yeah. Get them in there. Make them fight to the death. It's Ebola night on UFC. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's going to be a bloody good time. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. But, yeah, but people were totally freaking out and shit. There was a, a ship that took out, a cruise ship that took out of Galveston Bay, and one of the doctors that worked on the Ebola patient, or one of the nurses, I think, was on that cruise ship. And so they had to sequester the cruise ship for a couple of days till FEMA could fly out there and uh, test everybody for it. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, okay. It, it seems interesting to me. This is This is where my paranoia comes in. It seems interesting to me that uh, two nurses that treated the Ebola patient, mere weeks after they treated them, took a trip. One took a trip to Ohio on a plane, and one took a cruise ship. These right. these had to have been pre-planned. I think right. it's, it's it's kind of kind of unbelievable that. You know, the, the Ebola thing would happen just before they both were going on vacation. Yeah. You know, doesn't that seem unlikely? Uh, that seems a little unlikely, but, you know, if this is any cons- any kind of conspiracy, man, we need to get better people in charge of conspiracies because this, this sucks. Oh, I know what my other idea was. One death. One death. Uh, yeah, I know. They need to, yeah, they need to step it up. Yeah, really. Now, my other theory is this. We should have people dropping in the streets like fucking flies. (laughs) My other theory is this. Has anybody, and I put this on Facebook and nobody responded to it, and I even tagged it it Fox News. Has anybody checked into whether the man who died of Ebola in Dallas was a Muslim extremist? And that him coming into the country was a low-tech biological attack. What do you think of that one? Well, I think it's an interesting idea. But I figured Fox News would pick up on that since they're fear-mongering so much. Yeah. Republicans, the fear-mongers. Which is interesting because I – and they're the ones who always talk about communism, right? Or socialism. Right. Oh my God, we're a socialist country. I, when I was in high school, I read a speech for this VFW speech competition that was pre-written speech. I just had to memorize it. That was called "Fear: The Tool of Communism." Mm-hmm. Okay, so who do you think is is more, you know, communist than the Democrats who try to put a bright sunny shine on everything, or the Republicans who are just total fear mongers? You know, Uh that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. So this election year, uh, people, vote Bob. Vote Bob. Bob really should run as a candidate, and that did cross my mind before. Yeah, yeah. Because Bob could set this country right. Yes, he could. He could set the country right. Just watch the first episode, and you'll understand what we're talking about. Uh, well, you know, Fox News might not have picked up your your Facebook status, but I am sure that it's probably gotten you on a couple of watch lists. Oh, I've been on a watch list at high school because when I checked out the Communist Manifesto from the library. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've been on the FBI watch list forever. Yeah. I think uh, that's, I'm, I th- I'm, I'm seriously think that's how me and my brother's phones got tapped. Because we'll have an idea for a movie, or we'll write a line of dialogue or something, and we're talking about it on the phone, 
And all of a sudden, like six months later, the exact same thing shows up in a movie or on a TV show. Yeah. You know, like people were listening in. And yes, I did take my medication today. Yeah. Have you been getting a steady supply? <laughs> I have been. I'm getting ready to lose my steady supply, though. Because oh, well, I'm moving from Galveston County uh, to Harris County. And the place where I go to get my free medication uh, doesn't service Harris County, only Galveston County. Right. And so I'm going to have to drive into downtown Houston, which is like a 45-minute drive, without traffic. It's 45 minutes, uh, just to get my free medication. And my girlfriend is on medication, too, so I'm going to have to drive her down there to get her on free medication, too. And, you know, it's going to be a bundle of fuck is what I'm saying. Yeah. How, you know, how's it going with her? How are things going with her? Things are going really good with her. Uh, we're still trying to get the apartment so I can move her down here with me. But, uh, man, she is in love, dude. Yeah. I think probably for the first time in her life, she's in love with somebody. She's in love with me. And so, but it's so cool because, you know, because she's like, I, you know, I was like, you know, I said, you know, I'm almost, she's 19, uh, in case Bill hasn't heard. She's 19, and she, uh, let, let me tell you the story. I was in a psych hospital. Surprise, surprise. I was there for uh, about seven days and uh, met this, you know, met some people. One of them, uh, among them, uh, was this 19-year-old girl named Destiny. Love you, sweetie. And uh, I was talking to, like, one of her friends, and she wasn't really saying much. And then... Uh, uh, like, later that day, I saw her all, you know, uh, conspiratorially speaking to the girl I had been talking to and stuff. And later in the hallway, uh, she asked me if I heard what they were talking about. I'm like, no, I didn't hear a word. She was like, okay, good. The next day, I'm walking down the hall, and she walks past me, and she gives me a little smile and a wave. And later that day, we start talking a little bit. And uh -huh. stuff in the, you know, in a group, you know, but she's like talking to me and talking to other people and stuff. And we sort of got to know each other a little bit. And, uh, then the very next day, I'm like sitting in one of the chairs in the day room and she plops down in one right next to me and she goes, I have to tell you something. And I said, okay, what? She goes, you are fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know, that's the first time any woman has come up to me and said I was fine. And then uh, we had a conversation later that day about, you know, she was, like, asking me um, how young was too young for me. And I said, well, I said, the, the rule of thumb, from what I understand, is that you take half your age and then add, what is it, seven years to it? Yeah, seven years to it, and that's at the lowest age of person that you should date. Okay. And she said, well, would you ever date a 19-year-old? I said, I don't know. It all depends on the 19-year-old. And stuff, and she said, "Well, me? Would you date me?" I said, "Well, let me let me think about it for a couple of days." I said, "Because you are younger than my kids, which you know kind of creeps me out a little bit." I said, yeah. so "Let me think about it." So we continue to get to know each other, and and you know, just really liking this chick, and she's really liking me. And I told her, "Okay, we can we can we can go out." And that was the day before I left the hospital. I went back to uh, my apartment in Dickinson, which is hi Dickinson which is about 45 minutes or so south of uh, the hospital. Well, it's about 30 minutes south of the hospital where I was. And she gets out a week later and goes to a group home in Katy, which is like an hour, over an hour away from here. So we wow. haven't seen each other in two months. And I've just been talking on the phone every day. And, yeah, she's, like I said, I think she's in love for the first time in her life. And I hate to say I'm, I'm in love, too. Which I'm kind of surprised because well, it was a it was a nasty divorce and uh, don't don't, don't, don't hate end. to say that don't hate to say that is a good thing, man. Eh? It is a good thing, but it just surprised me, you know. Yeah. Because uh, it just came out of nowhere. I had been looking, you know, I'd been on plenty of fish and OK Cupid and all these sites trying to find some of it, um, and this just came out of nowhere unexpectedly. It was kind of cool. Sometimes you just really have to just kind of have to go with it you know i mean i really loved hope and when she died it really wrecked me for for a while yeah you know, but like, i remember 
you, you sold me. It was, it was apparently not that long of a while because I was in, a, in another relationship by the new year. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, um, I know you were broken up because you sold me a perfectly good car for $500 because of the car that she drove and you just couldn't look at it. So yeah. I know, I know you were broken up about that. Yeah. So, you know, that was really quick and that, that like caused a bit of guilt and things like that, but it's, it's, you kind of have to just be, you know, well, that's just how life goes. You yeah. Know? That does not mean anything. Where I am today does not bear reflection on the past. You know? Exactly. I mean? Yeah. And kiddos, you'll get to experience the same sensation when you get to be our age. <laughs> yeah. Sensation of the sensation of comparing the past to the present and stuff, but I just, yeah, like I said, it was a, it was a real surprise, and I've always heard and just never believed it is whenever you stop looking is when you'll find the thing you're looking for. Exactly right. You know, so for the kiddos out there, here's some advice: if you're looking for romance, if you're looking for a great job, if you're looking for you know anything, stop. Stop actively looking for it, and and it'll it, it'll pop up. It'll just come through for you. Because I looked and looked and looked for two and a half years uh, to find somebody online. Met a couple of women, about two or three, uh, very short lived relationships of you know uh, talking to them for like several weeks. That was about it, and stuff. And then you know met this girl, and and I mean you know stars in my eyes, right. Now, the thing was, is I talked to my ex-wife. Her name's Colleen. Uh, hi, Colleen. Um, probably three or four months ago. And we were we were coming up on, like, the, the two-year mark uh, that we had been separated. And uh, she said she wasn't dating anybody. She was just working on herself. She goes, it's too soon. Right. Two years? If I died, maybe it would be too soon. You know, if I died unexpectedly in your arms, maybe it would be too soon. But two fucking years is too soon. Yeah, she's going to end up like my mom. Hi, mom. Uh, you know, alone because she just, you know, can't get over the divorce thing. And right. decides that, yeah, that, you know, all men are bastards and there's no sense in, in giving your heart away to somebody because they're just going to break it. Uh-huh. You know? I feel like Ann Landers all of a sudden. <laughs> Maybe you should. Maybe you Maybe should. You should. A little column, get it get it in one of the local newspapers. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I actually was going to start writing editorials for this uh, paper out of Galveston. A- advice from the ninety nine percent. There you go. Advice for douchebags. <laughs> It's like we went uh, last night, you know, of course, Halloween. Uh, I was sitting home, was dealing with all this crap from the apartment, was in a really, really foul mood. And uh, surprise, surprise, my friend, uh, my friend uh, John calls me, and he was at work. Uh, they were having a Halloween costume contest. He was dressed up as Jesus and looked great. It was hilarious. Um, and... Uh, Oh, usually, not usually, but but occasionally on Fridays, we go to this bar out in Alvin. Hi, Alvin. Um, And go to karaoke. Most of the time, he doesn't want to go, you know. But once we get there, he's fine because we play pool in between, you know, me doing songs and stuff like that. But usually, I have to, like, beg him practically to go. And this last night, he calls me. He's like, hey, he said, uh, I'm off work, and the costume contest doesn't start till 11. You want to go do some karaoke? I was like, hell yeah. You know, so got out of the house and uh, went and did karaoke. And uh, he was all dressed up as Jesus walking around this bar, right? And right. I was walking around with him, and you know, people were like, oh, you're Jesus. And then they look at me. I had like this gray sweaty on with black jeans and a red T-shirt. And they were like, what are you supposed to be? I said, a douchebag. So that was my <laughs> Halloween costume last night. I was a douchebag. You should have said you were a leper. I was what? A leper. A leper. Yeah, look at my finger. Interesting and, and fact about leprosy. Interesting fact yeah. about leprosy. 
Did you know that leprosy is not a skin disease? Is what? It's not a skin disease. Um, it's a degener. It's a degenerative bone disease. When you see people whose fingers are all shrunken up and stuff from leprosy, it's not because the right. finger fell off or rotted off. It's because the bone is disintegrating inside and becoming shorter. It goes from like the tip and comes in. I mean, you still have like this, you know, scaly skin and stuff, uh, you know, in certain types of leprosy. But it's but it's basically a bone disease, not a skin disease. Huh. Okay. That's the interesting fact of the day, ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome, Bill. <laughs> I I have not looked too much into leprosy. I did uh, when I saw first time I saw Papillon. Have you ever seen yeah. that with uh, Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman? I great movie, people. Great movie. You should check it out. Uh, and I was watching that, and there's this part where he goes to the island of the uh, the lepers to get help uh, escaping. And this leper hands him, is smoking a cigar and hands him the cigar. He's, you know, you want a puff? And Steve McQueen just takes it and puts it in his mouth and takes a puff and hands it back to him. And uh, the leper laughs, and he goes, how, how did you know I had dry leprosy that's not contagious? And Steve McQueen goes, I didn't. <laughs> So after that, I, I decided I was going to look into leprosy and uh, see what it was all about and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's a degenerative bone disease. Now, now back on the Ebola thing really quick, too. People were sure. afraid of this huge, massive outbreak, right? Like in, I right. remember the movie Outbreak with Dustin Hoffman? Uh, yes. Because I think that's basically Ebola is what it was talking about. Ebola was found in Liberia in 1975. Right. If it was right. that it's fucking right. contagious, right. if it was that fucking contagious, everybody on this planet would be dead already. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So don't freak out. Sure, wash your hands. If you see somebody with an open wound, don't touch their blood. Don't, you know, lick their saliva. You know, anything like that. Use a labia shield. Um, and stuff. But, you know, don't, don't completely freak out just yet. Oh, no. You know? Freak out. Freak out? No, no. I, I, I would, I, I would enjoy seeing people freak out in the streets and just. just so you, uh, you, you err on the side of caution. Reading. You just want to see people what? freak out. You err on the I side of see. of caution, or do you want to see people freaking out? Well, I've, I've, I've always been pro apocalypse. <laughs> so, <laughs> pro apocalypse. You know, is that, is that going to be your running slogan for Bob? Yes. When yeah. you for president, uh, I am pro-apocalypse. I have always felt that the cockroaches have been more than patient. You know, they have, been. and it's it's there because really, when you're talking about the cockroach, you're talking about the meek. Okay, you see how this all plays in. This is yeah. what Jesus is talking about. The cockroaches <laughs> will inherit the earth. Yeah, the insects okay? by any means. And, and I think they've, I think they've put in their time. They've waited. They've been patient, you know. Um, so yeah, seeing people like, like running through the streets and going insane and smashing in windows and screaming, festival, festival. That would, that I, I would really enjoy that. <laughs> oh man! So, so, so I, I guess we can. I guess we can take it, uh, you know, as for granted that Panic at the Disco is your favorite band. Is what? Panic at the Disco is your favorite band. I do not know them. You're more more musical than I am. You know that. Well, that's because I have gas more often than you do. Thank you. I'll be here all week. Glad to be here. But, you know, and, and I, I, I kind of think that that's probably why Ebola is kind of hot, hot button topic because as far as communicative diseases go and things like that, it's kind of a cool one with the bleeding out of the eyes and you know all that kind of stuff. You know, it's it's some real Stephen King shit. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a fun little disease. <laughs> Now, an interesting thing that I saw on the Internet that somebody brought to my attention, 
is the uh, conspiracy theorists, um, yeah. the awake people, you know, that I've mentioned on the show before. Be afraid, people. Be very afraid of the awake movement. They pointed out something that's kind of interesting. Uh huh. In on many occasions, when you see somebody on the news talking about Ebola, right. they're wearing a green shirt. Okay. And this is their conspiracy. They they believe it's a conspiracy because of that. You know, they're they're using mind control through color coding to. You know. Like I said, you know, you can't find the awake movement by, by, uh, by searching for it on the internet because it, you know, they're kind of clandestine. They, they, they're like, they're like Jehovah's Witnesses. They go door to door, you know, <laughs> spread their spread, this, you know, one person at a time and stuff. Yeah. And uh, but you can find them. They're out there, and 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 most of like the really heavy uh, conspiracy conspiracy theorists. Uh, you know, are are members of the awake movement. And like I said, just just be very very afraid because their brand of and uh, propaganda and disinformation is just dangerous. You know. <laughs> I don't know, man. I you know, if this if there is this all powerful source, this Illuminati, this Whatever, yeah, you know, and especially whatever it is being controlled by Satan, yeah. Why aren't they? Why aren't they just kind of like at this point, just sort of like, you know what? Fuck you. We're in charge. We've been in charge for a really long time. It's yeah, over. yeah, exactly. We, we are here. Don't worry about it anymore. <laughs> Yeah, but if you'd like to know more about the Illuminati, there was a very, very intelligent, uh, uh, what do they call that, satire novel uh, called the Illuminatus Trilogy. Uh, yeah. For listeners, listeners, Bill, uh, kiddos, pick up a copy of that book and check it out. It's it's some pretty interesting stuff. And it actually does kind of give you a history of the Illuminati while, you know, poking mild fun at it uh, in the meantime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read this book uh, when I was in high school, uh, and I always made sure I had a big fat doobie uh, before I started <laughs> to read it because it just made me giggle. <laughs> cool. Well, well, yeah. give us give us some highlights. Oh God, my brain's so burned out, I can't give any highlights. Really, except there's, I mean, there's stuff in there like you know, the Ford Motor Company is in league with the aliens to, you know. Stuff like that, you know. Kmart is 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 uh, you know joined up with you know some other group, and it's like this big, huge, gigantic conspiracy theory book. Yeah. It's very entertaining, though. Yeah, as far as I understand, I heard from a friend once that there was actually a a, a card game called the Illuminati. You know, sort of like I, I hate to put it in the same place, but kind of like a Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or something like that. Yeah, one of those card where, games. Yeah, or like Magic the Gathering or something like that, where yeah. where your cards would have different organizations that were all part of the Illuminati, like the Boy Scouts. Um, yeah. You know, and by having the Boy Scout card, you would have a certain amount of power that you would be able to play against somebody else's Illuminati. <laughs> yeah. And it's Illuminati, not Nanti. It's Illuminati? No, Illuminati. No N. Yeah, uh, Illuminati. I should correct that before they come get me, huh? You should. <laughs> Look, you motherfucker. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you want people to know about us, at least pronounce it right. Although my, my kind of two favorites are um, kind of like conspiracy theories and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Denver airport is great. I haven't heard There's this one. There's a lot of stuff. Oh no! You, you just do some do some googling on on the Denver airport. There, there's some good stuff and there's some good howling. Uh, you you got to admit, at least they chose some really fucked up artwork for the for the Denver airport. There's <laughs> strange shit. There's like a yeah. giant mural that is kind of 
depicting like genocide. <laughs> nice, very nice. <laughs> it's really very strange. Uh, but supposedly the death attack on humanity is supposed to be coming from the Denver airport. Well, there you go. Did the Ebola victim uh, transfer to Houston from Denver, I wonder? I, I don't know. And then, of course, my other favorite is, is uh, the Montauk conspiracy. Oh, yes. Well, that's kind of fun for me because I, I was raised on Long Island. So yeah. I've been out to Montauk several times. Montauk is beautiful. Beautiful fucking place. Yeah. And there is an old uh lighthouse on Montauk. Yeah. That the military guards. Nobody knows why. Why are they guarding the lighthouse? Yeah. I mean uh, the, the, as, the lighthouse. Yeah. As we were growing up, um we just kind of suspected that maybe it was like a nuclear silo or something like that. Uh huh. You know, which still makes more sense to me. But supposedly the Montauk Lighthouse is a super scientific research facility where all of the debris from the Philadelphia experiments was brought to. Ah. Uh-huh. Okay, and the Montauk Lighthouse does have a time tunnel. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we report, you decide. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and there are a lot of stories of them creating like sleeper agents, you know, yeah. very very Manchurian candidate kind of stuff where yeah. they will take somebody to turn into an agent, and they are like trucked up with a lot of LSD and sexually abused and all kinds of things until their psyche fractures, yeah, so that they can implant certain commands into basically a separate personality, yeah. That they can then trigger it some of the time. Yeah. And with the with the nanobots that are going to inject us with with the uh, Ebola vaccine. Most possibly, yeah, most possibly. And then there was supposed to be an underground kind of railroad system on Long Island that would go from Montauk to the Brookhaven National Labs to a couple of other spots on Long Island. I forget what and go back. Yeah. I love that idea. I totally love that idea. (laughs) This is this is Long Island, man. It's a giant fucking sandbar. Yeah. Okay. You can dig a well with a fucking shovel. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Not like down here in Texas where they have Texas they have this stuff called gumbo. Yeah. Which is clay and sand mixed. Yeah. And oh god, you don't want to dig in it. You you get on Long Island, man. You dig down about ten foot, you're hitting the water. Mm-hmm. So how do you make this elaborate subway system? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and really, by, use, by, you know, by using the uh, by using the technology they learned at Roswell. Well, you know exactly. Can't they? Can't they just open teleports? You know they have a time machine. Yeah. Okay. They can't. They can't just like open like a stargate from one place to the other. That is more plausible than an underground railroad system. <laughs> yeah. But Long Island is a strange place, and Long Island is a place where you can cook up a lot of conspiracy theories. Yeah. You know, just because it's, it's so odd. Because there is something going on, on Monta- out on Montauk. That's true. Yeah. What it is, you know, I, I, I don't believe any of the conspiracy theory about it. Yeah. But there is something going on out there. And Long Island 
has two nuclear accelerators. Interesting. Cool. They have one at Brookhaven National Labs, and they have other one at the State University. Interesting. Okay. And Long Island is the military-industrial complex. Yeah. Okay. So when you take Iron Man and Stark Industries, Mm -hmm. you put them on Long Island. It was exactly where Stark Industries was. Yeah. Because you had you had all. I mean, you know, at this point, so many have merged and blah blah blah. You know, but Northrop was there when it was just Northrop and Grumman. You know, they they merged. Yeah. Republic, Fairchild, Boeing. You know. All of these places were Lockheed. all on the island. Lockheed, yeah. Yeah. So this was the industrial military complex. There you go. Huh. But see, I believe that the military industrial complex age has passed. Yeah. And now it's now it's the military corporate. Not so much industrial military, anymore. Military corporate? Yeah, that 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 the military is still you know controlling things in ways, but that corporations uh, have far too much sway with our government and yeah. stuff because they're the big donors, you know. Well, fucking just about any corporation has too much sway over our government now. Yeah, and I don't believe our government has as much sway over our government anymore. No. You know. We 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 the people certainly don't. Oh, fuck no. We are so far removed from, I mean, people talk politics all the time, and I think I've said this on the show before, but nobody does anything. It's talk, 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 talk. So get out there, people. Write your congressman. Write your representative. Write the president. Write the vice president. Let them know what's on your mind so they know better what to do for us. Because otherwise, they're just guessing, and they're doing what's best for the pockets, what's best for the pockets of their friends, and for the corporations of America. But then my question is, what for? What do you mean? I do not believe for a second that they that they give any kind of a fuck. Oh, they want to be reelected, so I think they do. They kind of have okay. to a little bit, because they well, have to be reelected. <laughs> That's going under the premise that, like, the people elect these fucking people. Yeah. Does any does okay. any of our listeners, uh, Bill, Bill, how much do you know about the Electoral College? The Electoral College is this, people. A person from your state is chosen to cast his vote into the Electoral College based on the votes you cast in your state. But... There's well, a loophole. It's supposed to be based on that. It's supposed right. to be based on it, but there's a loophole that says that that executive can cast any vote they want. So, and so initially, what Bunny's saying uh, uh, is is that your vote does not count really because at any moment your representative could decide to go the other way. As as long as the election process. You know, regardless of what election it is, as long as that's based on money and how much money you have, yeah. Write your congressman all you want. Tell yeah. him what you want. Tell him yeah. what we the people want. And when he gets a check for ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars from somebody else, yeah. that's what's gonna happen. Yeah. You know, so that's where my problem is. You know, I, I hear what you're saying, get involved in all that, but to what end? You know, to what end is is for what point? Yeah, you know, you go to the electoral college through the through the entire history of this country. Do you realize that only nine presidents have won the fucking popular vote? Yeah, that's really I did not know that. Only nine presidents yeah. were elected and yep. had the popular vote. Yep. Yeah, Gore got so, screwed. So here we come again 
and we're going to be coming up to the to the presidential election again. 2016, it's, right? It's going to be a dog and pony show, like it yeah. always is. Yeah, 2016. Yeah. 2016, and I and I'm going to have to start uh, working on my campaign again for uh, the Sarah Payne, Taylor and Michelle Bachman ticket. Yeah. Yes. I, I would, you know, I would vote for them. I would totally vote for them. You know, because. Their 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 motto is going to be their motto is going to be we've got crazy in spades. Yeah, the the, the country is going down. I want to see it go down in flames. <laughs> let's you're not, not going to be you're quietly. not going to be happy. Yeah, let's not go quietly into that good night. <laughs> yeah, well, what what movie is it uh, that the line comes from? Uh, or is it a book? The world ended not with a bang, but with a whimper. Um, Do you know that I one? Think, I think that's a. I think that's a poet. Really? That originally did that line. Yeah, I just uh, always love that line. I know they put it in Stephen King's The Stand. Oh yeah. I think he actually had it in the book as well. Yeah. But I think it's actually a line from a famous poet someplace. Yeah. You know. Okay. But yeah, you know, a Sarah Palin, Michelle Bachman ticket will get me closer to my apocalyptic dreams. Yes. You're just not going to be happy till there's an insurrection. I, oh, 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 please, yeah. Please. <laughs> yeah. What I would give for some armed insurrection right about now. Just and a cheeseburger. Gorillas in the streets. You know. Yep. Molotov cocktails. Yep. Yeah, not very effective, but they're cool. They're just cool. Yeah. They're cinematic, is what they are. Yeah, I mean, I, I also, I also think that this is why apocalyptic stories, and now in particular zombie stories are so popular in this culture because regardless of how scary or not scary you might find a zombie, at least in that kind of a world, you have control. Yeah. Where in the real world, we don't have any kind of fucking control at all. I can barely control my bladder. This is true. (laughs) <laughs> I've seen it. I've seen it in action, people. <laughs> I literally have a bladder the size of a disco purse. <laughs> and speaking of that, I think it might be time to go because i got to uh, let the bad liquids out. Okay, dude. Uh, Want to pin some stuff before you go? I certainly would. I'm Stephen Scott Norfolk. You can find my books on Amazon.com. They are Dreaded Friday and Other Tales, a collection of short stories, The Alleys Ran Red, a horror detective novel, and Under the Nom de Plume of Maxwell Robeson, The Spy in Mom's Clothing. Also look for a film I co-wrote, now available at many outlets, called Haunted Trailer with Ron Jeremy. And coming soon, our second feature that I helped co-wrote, and it is called Getting School. It should be released in December. Funny. Excellent. Uh, I want to see Bob become a hit. So Bob's 30 Shorts on YouTube at Undead Cow Films. Come watch it. Turn out. Make an old man happy. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a happy That's ending, it. people. He deserves it. <laughs> That's it. We'll... See y'all next week on Dying Generation. <laughs>